uh, we have certainly more than a quorum here. I'm also pleased that a number of my students have <laughs> made the scene here, so I think we can begin. So let me first of all welcome all of you. Um, Mondays are sometimes not the day that people come out <laughs> too often, uh, and the weather is not all that nice either, so we're delighted that you're here. Uh, of course, it is a talking blasphemy, so what more did you want? Um, I need to do something at the start here, which is simply uh, thank the various groups that have helped to sponsor uh, this particular lecture. And there are quite a few of them, so let me just mention them in turn. First of all, the Religion Department, um, which uh, has been very generous in terms of this particular lecture, uh, as well as the Humanities Center, uh, Arts Lehigh, uh, the English Department, the Philosophy Department, and of course the Lehigh University Art Gallery. So we thank all of those folks for making this possible. Uh, the other thing to say is this, that um, for those of you that hang out in universities, you're aware that April tends to be the month when everybody has their lecture. So there are lectures going on all over the place. Uh, we can't do all of them, but some hopefully will be of special interest to you. And I did want to mention the fact that this Wednesday, and some of you may have a poster for this, there's going to be a lecture by Professor Brian Rennie, uh, who is a leading scholar of the famous comparative religion scholar, Mirce Eliade, but he's not really speaking directly on Eliade, he's speaking about art and religion with some kind of Iliadian reflections, I think, on that. That's Wednesday, also at 4.15, but it's over in McGinnis uh, Hall uh, in room 102. So please uh, come by. Uh, I think uh, you will enjoy that. Brian is quite a dynamic speaker, and he probably is the world's leading expert on the hobby right now, as well as other related matters. So you're all cordially invited to that, and then, my chair would be quite angry with me if I didn't mention the fact that Brian speaks at 4 to 15, and then later in the evening at, what, 8 o'clock? Yes, 8 o'clock, in Sinclair Auditorium, Philip Jenkins, who is uh, a chaired professor at Penn State and an exceedingly prolific author on all manner of religion topics, uh, will be speaking. Uh, he will be, in fact, the featured Connell lecturer um, here at Lehigh for this semester. And he's speaking on the new global Christianity. How should we rethink theology? Um, so again, uh, we cordially invite all of you to that talk. Uh, there are, I'm sure, other things going on, but I did want to mention one other talk, and I guess I don't have the brochure. Maybe some of you have it out there. Next Monday is, a actually it's not a talk, well there's some talk, but it's the showing of apparently quite an exciting uh, video called New Muslim Pool. It's apparently hip hop Islam. And the filmmaker is going to be present, um, as well as I think the actor in the film. So, that is of special interest, and I certainly invite you uh, to take that in next Monday. Um, so anyway, a lot of exciting things coming up. But today, I am delighted to introduce you to our speaker. And uh, the topic, as you know, has to do with blasphemy, but let's Actually, it's a little bit different than we have built here. Um, the building we had originally was blasphemous art in a secular age. And I can't resist but uh, read some of the little blurb that Professor Plate sent us with regard to that. Um, as he says in the 1930s, T.S. Eliot said, I am reproaching a world in which blasphemy is impossible thinking that in the 1930s that the world had become so exceedingly secularized that it was impossible to blaspheme anymore. Things have changed, <laughs> haven't they? Uh, in all sorts of ways. As Brent says here, 80 years later, you seem to be living in a different world. 
one in which blasphemy is alive and well. While there are political and social approaches to the topic, this presentation is presentation. We'll look at the role of the visual arts as particular instigators of accusations of blasphemy. <coughs> From Danish cartoons to Madonna's concert performances, Monty Python, Andreas Serrano, and we have perhaps a blasphemous Serrano right in the back there. That'll be the test after the talk. We'll go around and pick out the things that are truly blasphemous. Uh, Professor Plate will suggest how blasphemy needs <clears throat> both an artist and an accuser. To understand blasphemous art, <clears throat> we have to take note of the context in which blasphemy occurs. Let me just say a word about Professor Plate. Uh, as you can see from the screen here, uh, he is a social professor, visiting social professor at Hamilton College. He's taught in many other institutions, and he's been exceedingly active in the American Academy of Religion in all sorts of different ways. He just is coming from a conference on religion and media at NYU, and um, he is quite prolific. <clears throat> I tend to think of all scholars who aren't my age as being younger scholars these days, but uh, Brent has been around, and he's published um, many different areas, and I just want to give you a sense of the range of things that he's published. Um, in fact, his most recent book is not the Blasphemy book, which you're looking at, we were looking at the cover on that Did I get some? Yes, the cover of the book there. Uh, but the most recent book is a book called Rel Religion and Film. Uh, published by Wallflower Press in 2008. As a matter of fact, we're using selections of that in the course that I'm doing right now. And I recommend it to you. The thesis being that it's not just that film uses religion or vice versa. The interesting question is to what extent is film or art like religion? <clears throat> and that does raise interesting uh, questions. <clears throat> anyway, religion and film. Uh, other books that are recent works of his, Religion and Film Reader, which came out in 2007. And then the one that concerns us today, the book on blasphemy, Art That Offends. Um, I've got a copy of it up here, but it was uh, interested in looking at it later. Of course, it does make us think, see the cover here, that's the Maurizio Catalan sculpture of the Pope hit by a meteor. Then when we think about what's going on these days, maybe it's particularly appropriate to see that image. Um, as well as a book called Walter Benjamin, Religion and Aesthetics, uh, Rutledge in 2005. Uh, another, this is another wonderful work of Brent's, Reviewing the Passion, Mel Gibson's film and its critics, uh, which was Paul Gray Macmillan in 2004. Representing Religion in a World of Cinema, Macmillan 2003, etc., etc. But I also want to mention one other thing that he is well known for. He's the head editor of one of the more exciting journals, new journals, uh, called Material Religion. And if you're curious as to what that might mean, uh, you'll have to come up and take a look at it, or obviously go online. It is truly an interesting uh, publication. So we're delighted to have uh, Professor Plate with us. And without further ado, as they say, Brent, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out on a rainy Monday. This is the song, Rainy Days and Mondays. Thanks, Norman, and uh, thank you to the various apartments at Lehigh and the galleries here for uh, bringing me here. Thank you, Norman, for uh, the work of uh, organizing the time here. Happy to be here. I should say uh, right up front, uh, the presentation is R-rated. Um, so just so you know, ahead of time, there are uh, naked bodies and things like that that are, of course, uh, uh, part of the uh, interest of blasphemy, of blasphemous art. 
I gave a similar talk at uh, college a few years ago, and um, they were video recording it, and they made me sign a waiver before, saying I would not be showing anything offensive. And I said, well, this is the nature of what I'm talking about. How can I not you know, show something offensive? And, uh, they said, I'll just, just give it about it. You'll, you'll be okay. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming it's okay to show you offensive uh, images here. Once upon a time in Denmark, a children's book author named uh, Karib Lukin wanted to make a book about the life of the prophet Muhammad. Lukin complained that he couldn't find anyone to make illustrations for it because artists believed depictions of the prophet were blasphemous in Islam, and they feared being attacked by religious extremists. Perhaps their apprehension was heightened by the murder of rebel filmmaker Theo van Gogh in the liberal streets of Amsterdam after he made the film submission in 2004. The 10 minute film criticized the treatment of women in Islamic society, these are a couple stills from it, and many Dutch Muslims considered it to be blasphemous. The, Islami the Islamist militant Mohammed Boyari took Sharia law into his own hands as he shot the filmmaker several times and then pinned a radical manifesto to his dead body with a knife. With Van Gogh's murder fresh in the North European consciousness, the politically conservative Danish newspaper, Jelens Posten, stood up for their freedom to express and commissioned a number of cartoonists and caricaturists. caricaturists in other words, they weren't illustrators, and this is an important uh, difference. Um, and this is where the uh, provocation began. Um, if you want to see, there's a great article uh, Art Spiegelman did uh, a year or so after this in the New Yorker that sort of went one by one as a you know as a professional uh, artist uh, himself and someone trying to get caricature um, down. He went one by one and just explained these are just awful pictures. <laughs> they don't work on a number of levels, you know, and they just you know the the, the issue is um, uh, very very uh, poignant that the aesthetically uh, and politically they don't work uh, you know at least beyond the blasphemy. So they were asked to draw images of Muhammad as the artist or the caricaturist saw him. Most were silly, hardly salient. A couple were so, so poor in quality and execution that the paper should have been downright embarrassed in retrospect for even printing them. While several of the images were nasty, aggressive, and violent depictions. Now, not much happened after this initial printing in September 2005. Nor did things happen the next month when the independent Egyptian paper, al Fagir reprinted several of the cartoons during the holy month of Ramadan. Right there on the front page, they reprinted this in Egypt. Nobody really said much about this. However, protests around the world, many becoming violent, began in early February 2006, after several papers across Europe, apparently with nothing better to do than recycle four-month-old stories, reprinted the images. Now the newspapers were able to generate their own news, and people took notice. Pockets of Muslim groups around the world, uh, primarily in war-struck, poverty-struck poverty areas, reacted against a European media and the West in general that seemed intent on provocation, a provocation encouraged by brisk sales at newsstands. Muslim leaders called for economic embargoes, flags, especially Danish, were burned, sticks and stones were thrown, fires started, people killed. If some Muslims were offended by negative portrayals of what they found sacred, namely Muhammad, many Western journalists, bloggers, and barroom pundits responded by showing what the West, modern West holds sacred, namely free expression. While the issues raised through the so-called Danish cartoon controversy touch on a number of facets of human life, the flintstone that sparked the upheavals was a handful of images. New York Times art critic Michael Kim Kimmelman pointed towards this imagistic power in the midst of the riots. He said, to many people, pictures will always mysteriously embody the things they depict. Among the things, the issues to be hashed out in this affair, there's a lesson to be gleaned about art. Even a dumb cartoon may not be so dumb if it calls out to someone. Artists' intentions are one thing, formal evaluation of images, another, and the reception of images, in spite of how dumb they may be, still another. To understand the place and function of blasphemy, it is necessary to take stock of the power of images and the ways they call out to people. Images seem to acquire some power through a quasi-alchemical process. Fine ink lines drawn on paper, curves here, straight line there, and bam, there's a depiction that will really upset someone. 
or maybe a little pigment, a little oil, a surface to work on, and there's a representation, slightly skewed from the real world, that induces tears, that rouses people from their dogmatic slumber, and makes them journey hundreds of miles to bask in the presence of the image. Many recent exhibitions uh, have been noting this uh, more and more, uh, the power of the exhibition itself. But just what is blasphemy, and what does it have to do with images? And our modern Westerners, as poet T.S. Eliot bemoaned, living in an age in which blasphemy is impossible. To a concurring opinion statement from a 1952 U.S. Supreme Court censorship case, Justice Felix Frankfurter appended a lengthy list of definitions for the terms sacrilegious and blasphemy, called from dozens of English dictionaries stretching back to the 17th century. His point was to prove that neither term had a consistent, objective meaning that would allow legal conclusions to be drawn from that. Definitions ranged from stealing from the church to attribute to God to that which is contrary to his nature. What set Frankfurter and the uh, Supreme Court on this definition of quest was a short film by Roberto Rossellini called The Miracle. In the film, a somewhat confused and inebriated shepherdess woman has, has sex with a wandering stranger. The stranger was played by Federico Fellini. Envisioning him, she envisioned him to be Saint Joseph. And when she becomes pregnant and imagines the child is divine, her neighbors scorn her. In the end, she flees town and gives birth in a mountaintop church. And she's, she's imagining he's Saint Joseph, so therefore this child must be something like Jesus uh, along the way. The National League of Decency called Rosalini's film a sacrilegious and blasphemous mockery of Christian religious truth. While in New York, Francis Cardinal Spellman, the American Pope, led protests against it, prompting the New York Film Board to ban screenings of it. However, the Supreme Court ultimately reversed the New York State ruling, asserting the right to free speech set out in the First Amendment. Actually, up until this point, literature had been protected, but this is the first case uh, that allowed film to, be, to go under that um, uh, free speech uh, dimension of the First Amendment as well. But what's interesting is rather than turning to historical legal, or I'm sorry, um, rather than us turning to historical legal and the theological definitions of blasphemy, which tend to be some variation of speaking wrong against God, uh, I find the categories of the sacred and the profane to be useful for understanding the function of blasphemy, especially when it comes to imagery and the modern world. In its most literal definition, the sacred is, of course, that which is set apart from the profane. The sacred refers to beings, human and otherwise, places, times, objects which are elevated and are charged by divine and or human forces with power beyond that of the commonplace. The sacred has the power to bless, to cure, to make meaning and provide orientation in life, just as it has the power to kill, destroy, and generally make life miserable. The profane, by contrast, and contrary to popular parlance, is not inherently negative. It is only the everyday, the ordinary, that which is outside the temple. The sacred and the profane need each other for their very definitions. The sacred provides meaning and orientation for the profane. The profane sustains the sacred. Now, it's, for those of you who've studied sociology and religious studies understand it's a bit more complex than that, but uh, I'm working with these uh, basic, basic frameworks here. What becomes crucial is the semi-permeable border between the two. Due to the power of the sacred, there are rules and rituals that must be followed in order for those lines to be crossed. You take off your shoes, you wash your hands, you light candles. Social, political, theological, economic, and historical authorities keep these divisions in place, tell when and how the, the border may be crossed, and thus establish and maintain order. Blasphemy, then, is fundamentally about transgression about crossing the lines between the sacred and the profane in seemingly improper ways. Blasphemy does not play by established rules, does not respect the traditions of socially acceptable ways of ritualizing, and may even poke fun at well-respected symbols and myths. In 1989, uh, Senator Jesse Helms decried Andre Serrano's Piss Christ, a photograph of a crucifix submerged in urine, calling it blasphemy and insensitivity toward the religious community. In India, in the 1990s, Mako Fidi Hussain, uh, a Muslim artist, 
a Muslim artist, painted several abstract nude images of gods and goddesses, Hindu gods and goddesses. Here's one of uh, the goddess Durga. And has been subject to right-wing Hindu groups leveling legal charges and death threats against him. And he's had to go into hiding several times. He's an 80-plus-year-old 80, 80 man. In London, in 2006, Gilbert and George put on a show called Son of a God Pictures and included an image called Was Jesus Heterosexual? prompting conservative minister of parliament Anne Whitcomb to label the pictures blasphemous in the extreme. Um, I, when, as I was working on this uh, book a few years ago, uh, this, this issue came out with Gilbert and George, and I uh, wrote to the gallery and tried to get permission to use this image uh, in the book, and they said they, they, they refused because um, they said, well, we just don't think it's blasphemous, and therefore it shouldn't belong in your book. Uh, <laughs> that was interesting. Obviously, they didn't get the point of the book either, but uh, that's all right. Um, <clears throat> Dana International, transsexual singer who won the 1998 Eurovision Song Contest, performed a traditional Sabbath song in Jerusalem's old city. Her performance was met by complaints by an Orthodox rabbi who claimed it was blasphemous. A naked woman is photographed across sacred symbols of crosses and crescents, as in Katharina Kodra's Blood Ties from 1999, causing outrage, censorship, and charges of blasphemy in Poland. And also in Poland, Droto uh, Nisnowska, probably not pronouncing that exactly right. But um, again, another, um, uh, her image, obviously, male genitalia in the form of a crucifix, uh, caused her, uh, had, had many charges, she had to go to court and had to pay a uh, certain fine for this. Uh, as well as the gallery owners as well. Many of these, it's not just the artist, but the gallery itself who's uh, brought charges against. Another naked woman, this time black and accompanied by an all-black cast, save a white Judas, stands in the role of Jesus in a restaging of Leonardo's famous tableau in Renee Cox's Yo Mama's Last Supper from 1999, upsetting Catholic leaders in New York City and uh, city mayors, uh, Rudolph. Giuliani, uh, just after he went after Chris Ophelia's, if you remember the sensation exhibit, uh, went after Chris Ophelia's Holy Virgin Mary, um, about, I think it was about a, just a few months later. This also went up, Renee Cox's piece went up in the uh, Brooklyn Museum, and um, uh, uh, the mayor went after uh, this one as well. And just more recently, this was just from a few weeks ago, uh, Joanna Kropa came under attack from the Catholic League, uh, charging uh, the advertisement she did with PETA uh, as a blasphemous piece. A couple of years ago, Madonna appeared in her European concerts being raised on a mirrored disco cross. <clears throat> this happened across, uh, across the European continent in, uh, in various places. Word got out to the religious authorities, and uh, Madonna's accusations are at least ecumenical, having garnered charges of blasphemy and sacrilege by Protestant leaders in Germany, Catholic leaders in Italy, and Orthodox leaders in Russia with a few Muslim and Jewish voices chiming in as well. A Vatican cardinal, speaking with the approval of the Pope, called the disco cross scene, quote, a blasphemous challenge to the faith and a profanation of the cross. All of that, plus some homegrown US pressure from the Christian right, made the US screening of the concert on NBC a bit leery about showing the, showing the lifting high of the Madonna. Tight black leather, okay. A tri stripper style pole dance on an oversized horse saddle, okay. Half naked, spelt, sweaty bodies marked with stars of David and crescent moon, okay. Just no mock Roman crucifixions. One almost wants to give credit to the many NBC affiliates around the co country that had some problems with the overall package and decided simply not to show the tour special at all. At all. Most of the NBC affiliates um, somehow edited it out the scene where she's actually on the cross and it just sort of goes from the beginning of the song to her dancing around. You kind of see the cross in the background, but it doesn't show her. She's, she's literally lifted up and sort of gets flat and the cross sort of comes up. This is the beginning of the, of the song that she does. Um, so the, in the U.S., it was uh, had garnered enough of a controversy that uh, they edited out this uh, lifting up of uh, Madonna on the cross. And of course, anyone thinks such issues are resigned to the modern age. The history of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel fresco is a prime example that tells how many in the Vatican considered the nude figures to be problematic, eventually causing many of their privates to be covered over. Each of these cases help points toward the way in which blasphemous images have to do with some sort of impure mixing. 
There is nothing in itself immoral or evil about nudity, sexuality, or even urine. They are simply elements of natural profane life as humans. But when these are mixed with the potency of sacred symbols, then tongues begin wagging. All of the previous indicates that a blasphemous image is not a category of being in itself, but it is an entity that prefers a confusion between the sacred and the profane, challenging the accepted norms in particular times and places. No work of art is blasphemous in and of itself. It must be deemed so from within religious and or political power structures, whether small or large scale, and there are many examples in which an image has appeared without comment in one setting only to explode in controversy in another. Um, Chris Ophelia's Holy Virgin Mary, I should brought a picture of that, but um, um, was done uh, three years before and showed in uh, London at the same sensation exhibit uh, at the Royal Academy and no mention was ever made uh, of this image until it came, the show came to New York City and uh, Mayor Giuliani uh, began, the, began the outrage towards it, many people followed in. So context uh, uh, creates part of this. In short, what I'm suggesting is blasphemous art only occurs when there are three things in some combination, an artist, an artwork, and an accuser. The context for accusation includes everything from religious dogmatic assertions to media coverage to political posturing made by authorities seeking to appear as defenders of social decorum and morality. Blasphemy is a contested, fluid, and dynamic category of meaning. Taboo, offensive images serve as powerful components in the making and shaping of society since they reveal a public, general public's lusts, longings, fears, and repulsions. Leonard Levy, uh, an attorney who has uh, turned his attention to blasphemy in the last 20 years, uh, has really spilled a couple enormous books on uh, history of blasphemy. Um, he states, blasphemy is a litmus test of the standards a society feels it must enforce to preserve its unity, its peace, its morality, and above all, its salvation. Blasphemy and the accusation of blasphemy is a culturally symbolic marker that helps define societies and religious traditions. And against T.S. Eliot's ideas of the impossibility of blasphemy, modern liberal societies redefine rather than banish the sacred in spite of their best wishes. Many of these redefinitions can be seen in the appearance of the nation state, to give but one example, and its ideological enforcer of nationalism as a major factor in the social construction of the world. Nationalism emerges in the modern age as its own religious system, or as the uh, sociologist Joseph uh, Lubera suggests, nationalism has become a religion, a secular religion where God <coughs> is the nation. The sacred status of the nation is bolstered by foundational myths, such as, such as the uh, founders of the country. This is the uh, image of the apotheosis of George Washington in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda, uh, way up on the ceiling down in the 19th century. Um, rituals such as annual national holidays, World Cup football, uh, of course here moving to uh, the UK, and uh, flags as symbols. And they have their own sets of proper ethical behavior, usually composed as variations on human rights. <clears throat> Nations, like religions, do not develop, reform, and sustain themselves by abstract doctrine alone. Rather, they construct myths, rituals, and symbols to buttress the system. With regard to nationalism, one of the strongest symbols is that of the flag. In the United States in particular, the flag has become what anthropologist Sherry Ortner labels a summarizing symbol. It sums up, just as it stands for, the whole system. The U.S. flag, she suggests, is a conglomerate of ideas and feelings, including, theoretically anyway, democracy, free enterprise, hard work, competition, progress, national superiority, freedom, etc., and it stands for them all at once. Stemming from the Civil War era, factions within U.S. politics have worked to enact laws prohibiting desecration of the flag. The current language attempting to get a constitutional amendment for such a prohibition reads, quote, the Congress shall have the power to prohibit the physical desecration of the flag of the United States. The U.S. flag has been raised, burned, scorned, prayed to, argued over, and turned into what can only be called a national icon. Making the religious connotations even more apparent, in an address in 1898, um, uh, 
minister turned, um, well, muckraker and other things, uh, claimed that uh, the flag should be kept as inviolate as was the Holy of Holies in King Solomon's temple. And in almost every scholarly book on the subject, authors use the religious, note the religious nature of adherence to the flag in the United States. Artists working in the U.S. from the 1950s to the present have challenged the symbolism of the monolithic national image. Just one example, of course, Jasper John's uh, series of flags from the 1950s, but uh, this one from 1958. <clears throat> and this raises a number of questions. Is it still a flag if it is an oil on canvas painting? What if I took my daughter's red, white, and blue crayons and drew a flag on a piece of scrap paper? Would it be illegal for me to crumble, crumple it and throw it away? At what point does a flag become a flag? Issues raised have ranged from the theoretical to the economic, as the U.S. flag has been, has been pasted, printed, and stamped on all manner of sellable items. As with the post-Soviet challenges to free market capitalism, the United States, too, is awash in an admixture of the iconic flag with consumer product icons. There's an extensive U.S. federal code, code that lists a number of guidelines regarding the proper display of the flag. Like anything sacred, there are proper ways to care for and be in relationship to it. Within the code, there are general guidelines such as not flying the flag at night, without a light, or that no other flag should be flown uh, above it. <coughs> Various the Betsy Ross homepage, you can find these in, in many places. Um, but, uh, but what I think about interesting about this, it's a fairly uh, conservative um, uh, site and really is interested in the flag code as a whole. But what they what they actually go is and list the various flag code uh, violations and uh, among other things, um, when um, Tim Russett, um, let's see, if you can see that up at the top there. Uh, in 2008, Byron Brown, the mayor of Buffalo, ordered, ordered all flags at city buildings lowered to half staff in honor of news journalist Tim Russert. Section 7.1 authorizes the president, the governor, and the mayor of the District of Columbia to half staff the U.S. flag in certain circumstances. In other words, not the mayor of Buffalo. Um, so, and then a number of other, uh, you know, famous <coughs> George Bush uh, in the middle, stepping on the stepping on a flag, stepping stepping on an image of the flag. So it's all these violations of the flag. Uh, Janet Jackson's uh, costume malfunction made the news in the Super Bowl in 2004, and um, at the same time, uh, Kid Rock, the uh, um, uh, musician, came out with an American flag draped around himself uh, in clear violation of the flag code that says the flag should never be used as wearing apparel. Of course, you can go online and you can find uh, bikinis and underwear made out of, uh, you know, basically that looks like a flag. And according to the flag, um, rules and regulations, those are all actually illegal. Flags should never be used for advertising purposes in any manner whatsoever. The flag represents a living, uh, this is from the, from the uh, code here, the flag represents a living country and is itself considered a living thing. Indeed, akin to Talmudic prescriptions regarding the life of a Torah scroll, the flag, when no longer usable, should be destroyed in a dignified way, preferably by burning. Burning in a dignified way, though what that means is slightly ambiguous, deconsecrates the material of the flag, ritualistically carrying it from the realm of the sacred to the realm of the profane. Burning the flag in an undignified way would be mere desecration, an improper crossing from the sacred to the profane. So, by comparison, Here's two images. Here's the flag being burned and the flag being burned. But then you back up and you note the difference. Here are people protesting the uh, uh, U.S. invasion in Iraq on the uh, left side and um, some, um, I can't remember what group uh, they're from, I think from the VFW, uh, ritualistically burning these old uh, discarded flags. Two burning, the activity is the same thing. One is desecration and the other would be called deconsecration. A number of controversial art exhibits uh, have been at the heart of recent debates regarding the sanctity of the flag. Uh, beginning, in 19, well, beginning before that, but in 1966, in the midst of the Vietnam War, former Marine Martin Morrell exhibited several flag sculptures in a New York gallery. <clears throat> As a result, the gallery owner, Stefan Radich, was charged with casting contempt, and he was charged $500. The trials and appeals went on for several years. Uh, he was eventually vindicated, but not without the trials going all the way to the Supreme Court. 
Two decades later, when Dred Scott's installation, What is the Proper Way to Display a U.S. Flag, was exhibited at the Art Institute of Chicago in 1989. More protests and congressional debates began. President, uh, the first president, Jeff Bush, uh, called it disgraceful. But more importantly, it set up a new round of U.S. congressional debate about a constitutional amendment to ban flag desecration. The work consists of a photo montage of the wall, um, on the wall, composed of various images containing the flags. Some are being burned and some are draped over caskets. So the top uh, image uh, up there. Below the photo is a register book and a pen on a shelf. And finally, a U.S. flag is spread on the ground in front of the book and the image. The idea is that for the art viewers, the spectators, to become participants by signing and making comments in the book. But of course, to do so, one must uh, actually stand on the flag to be able to get to the register book to, to sign your thing. Actually, the way it was arranged, you, you actually could lean over. You didn't have to do that. But it was powerful enough of an image that uh, caused quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of controversy. <clears throat> By laying the flag down on the floor, uh, Dred Scott recreates the gallery space, separating sacred space from profane. Stepping here is permissible, there is not. One space is charged with power, the other is not. Connected with this was an interesting ritual that developed in the display of the flag in which war veterans would come into the gallery on a daily basis. They would pick up the flag, they folded it up, and put it on the shelf. In essence, they treated it as sacred and wanted to keep it uh, off the floor. Following them, then, the gallery staff, and sometimes viewers themselves, would take it off the shelf, unfold it, and put it back on the floor. And this developed, this went on for a couple week, uh, couple week period. This interesting uh, improvisational ritual uh, happened in the midst of it. So, <clears throat> with that, the comparison uh, trying to make is uh, with religious art, but also so-called what we might think of as secular or nationalistic art, and I think trying to make this relation, of course, between the, uh, between the two and the possibilities of desecration uh, in each different, each context. So as George Bernard Shaw once clipped, new opinions often appear first as jokes and fancies, then as blasphemies and treason, then as questions open to discussion, and finally as established truths. Every society has its taboos, and the concept of blasphemy allows us to look back to the forbidden symbols and activities of our past in order to inquire about our own present list of taboos. In so doing, we come up against the structures and strictures of our current cultures, enabling a certain charting of the permissible and forbidden that defines contemporary life. Thank you. <coughs> Um, yeah. Uh, just 
wondering if you had thoughts about the relationship between this and the Tea Party people that want their country back. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I want to go there. <laughs> um, in, in what way? I mean, that they think something, that the blasphemy has somehow occurred, and that, mm. uh, that some yes. sacred things, and I mean, the artists obviously need the other in order to have their art be anything else. I mean, you know, it's a flag that nobody recognized it, it wasn't even very far from the Fred Scott origin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it would seem that these defenders provide the artists the fodder that they need, but it's also, um, you know, maybe the maybe the, the sacred itself is being tied to politics in a new way, or do you think this is the same? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I try to develop that, you know, a bit more in the book and elsewhere, but um, it's kind of the, kind of why I'm trying to get to the national, <coughs> saying, you know, there's a new, this is a new form of, you know, the sacred. Um, and, yeah, and, and that can be transgressed against. Yeah, I, I think that's, that, that makes sense in that light. I hadn't thought of it, but uh, yeah, the, the Tea Party and, and other groups are, feel like something has been transgressed. Um, and, uh, like, you know, which of course raises an interesting question of the choice of name for the group, you know, in this, uh, you know, to the Tea Party itself was, was a transgressive act back in the day. And so it's, you know, it's, our rebellion in our way, but not that rebellion in that way, but it's selective rebellions. You know, some rebellions are okay and acceptable, and others aren't. And, you know, one, one wonders if uh, the uh, 17, what was the original Tea Party, I remember, but, uh, you know, 1773 or something. Um, but if that happened today, that would probably be labeled an act of terrorism. As to, you know, some of the events that went around in that, uh, curious, are changing rebellions. Uh, yeah, but I, yeah, I'm not, I, I'm um, just wondering what your thoughts are on one other distinction. Um, in the past, let's say, in a culture that everyone was religious in a certain way, and then blasphemy would come out of, let's say, a believer who does something offensive. Right. Now, today, of course, since there's the secular and the religious coexisting, why is it that it's blasphemous to the religious person when it comes out of, from the secular? Well, um... Oh, okay. So, so this should, as if these are these are separate realms. I, I just, I mean, I think what it shows is that it's they're actually not that separate, right? I mean, I think it, it shows that they're actually fairly yeah, intertwined. With or does the religious fear something that the secular is constantly? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think there's definitely that. I mean, there's certainly a lot of uh, a lot of fear, and there's you know what better what better way to generate support than to feel oneself persecuted in, in many ways and feel. You know, we're up against the wall because the, the secularists are out there and, and after us, and uh, that obviously has a lot of uh, a lot of power. But they, but they, you know, of course, they don't sort of exist in these, in these separate realms. And um, you know, I mean, there, there's interesting, you know, sort of stories of you know the, the ways these were separated. I, one of the one of the things I mentioned briefly in the book is um, uh, you remember when the, uh, the Buddha, the great uh, Buddha statues in, Af in Afghanistan, the Taliban blows up. Um, uh, Muhammad uh, Omar, you know, one of the leading people. Uh, apparently, he he's on record. I've got a newspaper, a uh, uh, UK newspaper clipping. Um, before he blew it up, he actually didn't have a problem with it. I mean, he was actually on record as sort of saying, "Look, there's no Buddhists here, so these actually aren't offensive." I mean, that was his first statement: is that they're not offensive because there's no Buddhists here. They're just statues. You know, he, he actually thought, and he also was a little practical. He thought, you know, these probably would serve as good, uh, you know, tourist income as well, people coming. But then other things happened, and it, you know, becomes a scene to, to blow them up. So it's, you know, here's an example of that kind of separation. That's okay. Even the even the Taliban, you know, are okay with sort of saying, hey, these are images. We don't, you know, they're not a problem for us. They're somebody else's images. So let's leave them alone. Uh, which I, I think is an interesting kind of. Know, contrary uh, uh, dimension to that, um, and I think you know there's, there's plenty of other examples of the ways people have just let things <laughs> let things be. In various places. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether your um, artist artwork and accuser needs a needs another category. Yeah, um, and maybe it has to begin with an A though. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, I can't give you that. Okay. Um, you have to think of that one yourself. But, but an interpretive community, especially because these things 
are, are contested interpretations and contested symbols right. in, yeah. in really important ways. And I, so I wonder the extent to which you think the interpretive community or communities here play a really fundamental role in, in how these symbols are adjudicated and how the notion of blasphemy actually gets developed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in some ways, I was, I was trying to push towards that. I probably wasn't developed enough here, but I, that is kind of what I mean by the accuser. You know, maybe it should have been accusers, but um, yeah, that, that is that kind of trying to get at the reception of it. And, and yeah, exactly, the interpretive community that that's where blasphemy, you know, begins to happen. You know, the, there's, there's only, it only happens if somebody actually sees it and someone actually responds to it, interprets it a certain way. So I, it was, that, in a sense, that was kind of, I was trying to do a shorthand towards that, but I, I absolutely, I think that's, uh, that is the key. And, and the act of interpretation in the midst of that, you know, and, and that there are also, that there are multiple, you know, communities and, you know, a group of, uh, a group of um, uh, war veterans fold up the flag and interpret it in one way, and the gallery people unfold the flag and see it another way. There's two different, you know, competing uh, interpretive communities uh, as well, which is uh, usually the usually the case. Yeah. Do you see, I'm looking at the picture there, anyway, do you see that uh, the victim and the powerful person and the uh, accuser are all the same person? I mean, blasphemy comes out of the power structure with the quote the word. He's the victim and, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The, that, they, that they might all be the same? They're all the same person, or, or all the same entity. Right. Yeah, and so it's always working backwards. It's always the accusers who, in a sense, instigate it and then it Call it's read backwards. Victim, but they're the power source that creates the blasphemy right. and the Yeah. Well, it, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's generally true. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, talked about the uh, 1952 Supreme Court case, and, you know, it, it, it helps that it's, um, you know, the, the Francis Cardinal Spellman, the American Pope, you know, who generates these kind of things. He's in a very powerful structure, you know, he's the one who makes this. They portray themselves as the big Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or you have, yeah, in, in various groups. Yeah, it's, it, you know, if I say something's blasphemous, it's probably not going to have the same effect as, you know, um, you know what, what William Donahue or somebody who's in, you know, national um, Catholic. What's his group? Catholic. Anyway, sorry. But he come, he, he's, he's a wonderful source because basically every other thing that comes out is blasphemous and just, just sort of keeps giving me more information. But, um, I sort of gave up listening to him because it's not interesting after a while. He just keeps calling everything blasphemous. <laughs> has he been? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, you're right. It, and so it is, it is about power structures, you know, but these are religious power structures, the political power structures, economic power structures. Um, and in the end, you know, Andre Serrano's career has, you know, not, not done too badly as a result of the controversy. And uh, Catalan's, um, you know, Maurizio Catalan, these things help start his careers along as well. So, I mean, there's power on a number of levels, economic uh, uh, power as well. And, uh, not to say that some people don't suffer along the way. You know, it's, you know, some of these artists, as I mentioned, uh, Hussein, this Muslim artist in, in India, you know, Death threats and actually go into hiding, and uh, you know, some rush to the course, and uh, you know, you don't want to live that way. But uh, certainly, also in the end, Rushdie's done pretty well for himself, uh, and I, I dare say that much of it did have to do with the, with the controversy itself. I mean, that he's a great writer. Uh, yeah. When you said the quote of Eliot, I thought I knew what it meant. And it's kind of simple, like nothing sacred anymore. And, uh, and then I started thinking about it, and I thought, what would a world that didn't have blasphemy look like? And, and, not, and it's kind of hard for me. To, I can see Vinali kind of shows the shell of the penis. <laughs> it's like, sort of reactionary. Yeah, so all yeah. certain kinds of blasphemy count or something. But what, do, what do you think you meant? Have uh, you thought about that? Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, he's definitely, you know, wanting to, he's, he's reactionary towards what he certainly obviously saw going on, and, um, you know. He wrote various lines. What's that? Because I know he wrote the wasteland and stuff, so I'm just wondering if he was 
I get that part, but I'm yeah. wondering, what does the world look like when you can't play? Right, right. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's, I actually don't think it's possible. I mean, part of, part of what I'm suggesting here is we never get away from it, and, and um, we're always going to hold something sacred, whether it's not in, in a traditional religious institutional sense, that's what's going to change. So I, why I started with the Danish cartoon controversy is because it's, it's competing sacreds. Free speech is held sacred by the Western media, by many of us modern liberals. Free speech is a sacred thing. Human rights are sacred things. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Um, these are these are sacred statements. Um, again, it's it's you know, we have to think about the differences between the secular and the religious, and you know how those can be separated, perhaps at times, but obviously they're much more intertwined with each other. Um, but the, you know, the fact is, if if it looked, I don't know, it, it would be some sort of anarchy, I suppose. If, you know, with uh, without without blasphemy, it would. Would be impossible because we can't establish society without something held sacred. Something's got to be there. That's um, um, yeah, self-evident and held and set apart. But but again, why I think why I got really interested in this topic was because it, by charting the ways these different sacreds, we begin to you know it's, it's a it's a way to think about the way cultures and societies are. Are created to sort of see the boundaries. You know, what are the limits to how far we can push something? Um, you know, there will always be things. You know, talk to talk to people about this, and you know, they say, "Well, oh, but really, we can do anything we want." I say, well, child pornography. You know, that's pretty much banned. Uh, you know, pretty universally uh, uh, reviled. Uh, there are things that we you know, don't want to uh, go too far. Um, certain imagery, obviously imagery coming out of, uh, you know, various wars, um, you know, looking at the, uh, the Iraq War. Um, <coughs> difference of images that Al Jazeera puts up and NBC puts up, you know, what's held sacred by certain groups. And, uh, so anyway, it's, it's just, I, I think part of what's, what's fascinating is not, I mean, it's blasphemy itself, but it's also what it tells us about our culture and our current situation. It's kind of what I'm you know, trying to get at. To mention one thing here to you, uh, by way of a kind of confession, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to invite uh, Brent here to talk about blasphemy is that some of us are currently thinking about um, doing a show that would basically be a show that would ask the question, what is blasphemous here in our own backyard? What has been blasphemous here? And I think we all know, because we don't have to think back to one ago when there were some photographs that were put up um, by the Lehigh University Art Galleries that triggered a firestorm. You know? um, but it's interesting to push that thing back even further. And I'm thinking with Jeff Gaiman and the audience who has written on this through the years, uh, it really would be intriguing to trace out some of the history of what has frightened people here in the Lehigh Valley. And we all know that it has to do with a lot of things. There's a history to it. There's a contextualization of that that we have to pay attention to. Uh, so we'll see. We should never see on this. Uh, it could be an interesting thing to do. Uh, and I suppose I'd also say that I welcome you to um, contact me or Professor Ricardo Rivera um, if you recall something in terms of uh, a particular scandalous thing connected with an art event here in the Lehigh Valley, uh, it would be interesting to start to compare notes uh, from different people's perspectives on that. Um, I can think you know, of maybe half a dozen or a dozen things that were newspaper-worthy events over the past 20 years or so, but I'm sure there are other things that perhaps didn't make it into the newspaper think about it. So anyway, I, that's my confession to you about <laughs> the last movie here. Uh, anyone have a last question here? A last question about blasphemy? Yes, here's a last question about blasphemy. How much do you think that the artists who do this blasphemous art do it as a strategy to gain notoriety as opposed to uh, just making art because they feel that it's relevant to themselves and to the art world. Yeah, I, I think it definitely, uh, it definitely goes on uh, at times. I mean, it's, 
you know, of course, you're never going to get a straight answer out of most of the artists who are creating it. Um, you know, uh, of course, Andre Serrano and Renee Cox and Chris Ophelia all sort of say, I'm a practicing Catholic myself, right? It's always the first response that they give. You know, I'm a practicing Catholic myself, so it can't be blasphemous. Um, you know, which is kind of, I'm not sure I <laughs> trust that, trust that statement, um, you know, in, in many ways. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a certain awareness of it that, you know, something is going on. I mean, when Catalan puts an you know, image of a meteor on, you know, one of the world's most uh, widely recognized sacred figures, uh, he knows he's doing something provocative uh, in the midst of it. Um, but again, what the, what the artist can't um, take account of is, is the reception of it, you know. I mean, that's part of, uh, part of being, uh, part of publishing, you know, part of making this public, part of doing your artwork and showing it is that, you know, you have to give up control of how it's going to be seen. And you can, you know, we can all scream, you know, I write an article and someone misses the point of my article. Uh, I can scream that, you know, you missed the point of my article, but, well, you know, it's kind of my fault too. But it's, uh, you know, I, that's what you get for publishing. Um, that's what, that's what happens when you, you know, I mean, an artist, Writers take, you know, have to both take responsibility, I think, but also give up responsibility. Um, it's not mine anymore; it's out there. Um, so I, I think there, you know, it goes both ways. You, you can, they can be provocative and try to do things. And there's, you know, I mean, as I started to research this, you know, it's just like it's so easy to find you know, these these sort of offense, images that can easily be offensive. But you know, there's there's good blasphemous art, and then there's just sort of schlock, you know, just. It's not really provocative. It's you know doesn't really doesn't really do much um, in the end. I mean I, I think you know Serrano. If you've seen the you know, Serrano's Piss Christ, that is you know if you've actually seen a print of it. I mean it, it is a, a beautiful image. It doesn't you know never shows up in the PowerPoint, but the, but the actual print of it is just just brilliant. If you see it across a gallery, you know it's just this translucent yellow, you know, and you're drawn to it. And you know if you didn't know what that was, you think, wow, that's a really reverential image, and of course, he knows what, yeah, I, I always think it would be interesting, you know, if we could reverse time and if he had left the title, you know, left it, you know, call it untitled or something, uh, or yellow crucifixion rather than piss Christ, you know, would have had a radically different response. It, uh, so Serrano came and spoke here, yeah. maybe a year or two after the big controversy over piss Christ, and uh, before he came, I went to visit him, I'm, I'm a journalist, I went and visited him in his Brooklyn apartment, and um, he admitted that, A, he was after beauty, and as you point out, this place is really beautiful, yeah. really radiant. But uh, he didn't, uh, he also admitted he was after notoriety. His <laughs> wife at the time wrote his grant proposals, and you know, they did very well. <coughs> yeah. But the crucifix that he used in his Christ was in his bathroom, and it was surrounded by about two dozen crucifixes right. above the toilet. Right. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that sounds like <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Well, on yeah. that note. <laughs> but we should point out there are some Serranos back yonder and uh, might be well worth the public to take a look. <laughs> anyway, let us thank the uh, speaker. <laughs>